Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Political Vigilante. I am here in my uh, illustrious uh, Four Points by Sheridan the studio. Uh, we just did a show last night, Ron Placone and I, and Coral Gables, which was amazing. Thank you to everybody that came out. And I have a very special guest uh, uh, joining us today, uh, Samira Khan. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. I've been very excited about this conversation. Yeah, so have I. I've, I've followed your work, and I think um, I was trying to get you, I know you're on the East Coast, I was trying to get you on Aggressive Progressive this week because I was guest hosting it, um, which would have been really That cool. would have been fun. Yeah, well, yeah. well, well but... Uh, next time. Yeah, next time. <laughs> I think we sort of, like a lot of uh, progressive indie media people, we always kind of, you know, we'll see each other's Twitter feed or, and we'll go, oh, hey, they, they're not crazy. Like, all right, like, I, you know, you, we, we kind of, <laughs> it's so hard sometimes, I think to find people that like, cause it, it, it and we're gonna get into it in this conversation, um, how nuts, we're, we're in crazy times. Like crazy, great right. like, people, it's crazy. And even at the show last night, you know, we, we sold out this cool venue in, in, in the Miami area and all these people came out and everyone's saying the same thing. Like, I feel like I'm nuts. I feel like I'm, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm crazy. Like, but, but, but let's, Go ahead. Also, it doesn't help that there are not that many people on the left who are genuinely anti-war. So <laughs> that narrows your um, audience a little bit. The, the, what, that's insane. So let, let's talk about that. So yeah. you know, Trump, who I, I, I don't like Trump. I'm not a fan of Trump um, for, for a myriad of reasons. When he announced, I want to pull out of Syria and Afghanistan, which he's now backpedaling on a little bit. But when he first said that, and I was like, great. And people on the left were like, what are you doing? And now all of a sudden, all these neoliberals are suddenly experts on the Kurds and exit strategy. And I'm like, we've been there Overnight. for- Overnight. Yeah, like, we've been there for 17 years. How about we get the fuck out and then we can kind of figure out how we want to help on a YouTube, you know, we can debate what humanitarian aid we're going to give or whatever. Like maybe we just, instead of bombing the shit out of these countries, we, we set, spend billions of dollars on hospitals and schools and infrastructure. And I don't know. That's what China is doing in Afghanistan. Actually there, they built a school and a hospital and yeah, China's done that. So it just goes to show how uh, far off the U S is. And you know, it doesn't just go back 17, 18 years. It goes back to 1979 when the U S or when, Carter first uh, signed the authorization to uh, fund the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. And it was, what, five months before the Soviet Union actually invaded? So that's also really hilarious. Yeah, the Soviet Union invaded, or invaded, they were actually invited by uh, the PDPA government in Afghanistan uh, over 21 times. And Brzezinski, he finally agreed in, in December uh, December 1979 and in July, that, before that, uh, Jimmy Carter signed that authorization to fund the Mujahideen, yeah. Uh, this is, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, Brzezinski, <laughs> yeah, Brzezinski yeah. openly admitted it. He bragged about it. He said, we pushed the Soviet Union to intervene or something along those lines. Yeah. <laughs> that's, right. that's amazing to me. Yeah, yeah. What? And as, as oh. for Syria, I mean, it's the same strategy, right? Funding, you know, these so-called moderate rebels. The original moderate rebel was Osama bin Laden. And these uh, moderate rebels turn out to be bloodthirsty terrorists. And yeah, um, same thing in Bosnia and Chechnya. And in China right now, we're also seeing it in Western China. Um, you know, you're hearing a lot about these Uyghur, um, we, uh, oppression of Uyghur Muslims in Western China, in, I'm going to butcher this name, uh, Xinjiang province. You're hearing a lot of, about that, but it's the same exact strategy. And they all you know, came from Afghanistan. So, well, all over the world. That's, that's insane. So I want to talk about but that, thank you for, for, for sharing that with us, because that's, again, more information that we're, the, we don't hear about in the mainstream media, um, which is, you know, yeah. but our, our lineage in the Middle East is, is laughable. I mean, like, you know, we, we've, we have, I mean, it's really, we do, it's, it's a real simple playbook what America does all over the world. There's a resource or something we want or a strategic 
a geographical thing that we want. There's a sometimes a democratically elected government that won't play ball with us. We get rid of them to back some psychopath. Uh, and then, you know, other crazy psychopaths join or, you know, like it's, it's, we, you know, we, we back the Shah of Iran. <laughs> like, like, oh. Well, yeah, overthrew their democratically elected leader, Mozadik, and put in the Shah. Um, because Mozadik was nationalizing his oil. Well, well that's, uh, you're like, that's the, sorry, we, we, you're done. If you do that or yeah. you're not going to use the petrodollar, you're getting one between the eyes. I mean, it's like. <laughs> it started um, from an ideological perspective. Uh, after Nasser, Nasser of Egypt was a very popular socialist leader. And the U.S. wanted to counter that by funding Islamism. And it started with the Muslim Brotherhood. Then through the Muslim Brotherhood, all of these Islamist organizations all over the Middle East, South Asia, Southeast Asia um, were, I guess, funded and uh, enabled. So it, it starts in the 50s, uh, it grew rapidly by the 70s. It's, it's quite insane and utterly ridiculous. But uh, most people, you know, this information is all online at our fingertips, but people don't want to learn. They would rather just, I guess, um, process talking points that they hear from the media. Oh, the Russians invaded Afghanistan, things like that. And then it's repeated so many times, they think it's, everybody just assumes it to be true and they don't really look into this. Um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we didn't have access to the internet, all this information. You'd have to go to a library, but now it's so easy. But people still choose to remain ignorant, so. Well, I think uh, you bring up an excellent point and, and um, part of it is, and I, I don't want to excuse that too much of that ignorance, but to put it in its proper perspective, I think that's by design. So- oh, of course, since know, the 70s. Yeah, we're just supposed to be working so hard and not have time to pay attention and now more than ever, like you've got, everyone's got to have two, three jobs and a side gig and you're supposed to, you know, and so there's no time. And I mean, I saw that the most evidence of that was the 2016 election, just friends of mine, people I think are, I would consider them fairly smart. They're college educated, just like, well, um, they would literally say, well, you know, single payer healthcare is pie in the sky. I'm like, God, that's a fucking talking point. You just repeated a talking point to me because that's what yeah. they put it out there, put it out there. And now they're very skilled at using you know, social media and there'll just be some meme popping around that everybody just sort of grabs a hold of. But, but I want to go back to the, there's no anti-war movement on the left. I'm so perplexed at this. And why don't you tell me that uh, poll that you just read? Well, yeah, um, we were discussing this poll earlier. Um, this came out a couple of days ago. It's a political poll on a uh, percentage of Americans that support uh, withdrawing from Syria and Afghanistan. Now on Syria, 29% of Democrats support withdrawing from Syria, 29%. 73% of Republicans support withdrawing from Syria. That to me is absolutely insane because you know, when Bush was president, most Democrats were in favor of pulling out of Afghanistan and Iraq. And now it's flipped. That just shows that they have no principles, no ideological commitment. It's just based on emotional tribalism and a, an emotional attachment to the Democratic Party. I'm going to support the Democratic Party no matter what, and I will oppose the Republican Party no matter what. There are no, there's just no ideology. And on Afghanistan, it's not so bad. 40% uh, of de uh, Democrats support withdrawing from Afghanistan and 76% of Republicans support withdrawing from Afghanistan. That's- And this isn't the, f yeah, go ahead. I mean, I like, I, I can't even, it's hard to get my brain around that because I was a kid in the seventies, right? So I, my first views of politics in America were, were Nixon's resignation speech and the Vietnam war and protests. So I, I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin and um, there was protests on that. It was called the Berkeley of the, of the Midwest and, you know, University of Wisconsin was there. And there were, I mean, my mom tells the story of 
she was uh, in a play, you know, my parents were theater people and she was in the, the dressing room watching students get the shit kicked out of them by cops because cops, they were, they were anti-war uh, protesters. I mean, she told the story of, and, and this is, you know, she was like, I don't like the, the violent radicals because there was a, they blew up a math building on campus at the University of Wisconsin because they were doing anti-war, re or they were doing war research, right? And they thought the building was gonna be empty and it was just gonna, and there was a grad student who was married with a wife and a kid and they killed. And my, so I mean, that, that's like how I, my, my, my view of the world was shaped as a young kid. Um, and also they, when we lived in Germany for a year, they took me to Dachau. That might have not been great parenting, but because uh, I was six years old. But so I was raised in this very left anti-war. My brother and I weren't allowed to have toy guns. And so to hear people who call themselves left or liberal now being like, war, I'm just like, how crazy is it? And I guess it's, 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 it's really good, like from a marketing standpoint, I'm like, wow, you guys have done a great job of making Americans just, we're so war- we're so anesthetized to it that we can't. Yeah, like you said, it's by design. Um, since the 70s, the U.S. government has shaped its school system um, to not enforce, you know, critical thinking abilities and everything. Um, so a, a lot of it has to do with that. I don't know much about it. Uh, Noam Chomsky has a good documentary on it on Netflix. So please do check it out. Um, but like you said, by design, and even during the Iraq uh, wars before Obama, during the Bush years, you saw people go out on the streets, you saw people protesting those wars, but then Obama came in, the Messiah came in, oh, we don't have to worry about anything. Um, meanwhile, he turned two wars into what, seven, eight? I, I lost count eventually. I still, today, I still don't even know how many countries Trump's bombing. Is it seven, eight, nine? Who knows? <laughs> it's, I mean, but, it's hard to keep track of. I mean, literally, right. like, Somalia, we're bombing, we're, 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 we're there. Like, it's, what? Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, but if you look at the early 90s as well, um, Iraq, once that girl came to, what was it, Congress about the, um, and talked about the incubator, incubator baby stories, and then uh, support for war just shot up. And then people on both sides of the aisle, they started supporting invasions. So you see a pattern. Uh, weapons of mass destruction, <laughs> 2002, 2003, Blair, Bush, everybody fell in lockstep behind the establishment. Hillary Clinton. Now, even Bernie, yes, he deserves credit for voting against Iraq, but he still said, Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. So he repeated those intelligence community assessments. And so that's how you know, eh, he might not be correct about Russia now. Well, so like, it, it, it's, it's a tradition, it's a pattern. You see, eventually people start supporting it. And then after the invasions, then they, try, they realize that maybe this isn't such a good idea, we should pull out, and then they start protesting. But now, I don't see any of that. There's no protesting. When part of it is too the corporate media. You know, if we saw footage of what our drone strikes have been doing the last however many years, like mm -hmm. you know, and when people on the left are like, you know, it's they call they coined the term, you know, Trump derangement syndrome. Uh, I, I read that on the Black Agenda Report, which was just so great because people on the left, Trump, 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 like, yeah, he's bad, but racism didn't start in January of 2017 in America. It's bad. He's exactly. getting but like, okay, it's been here. I mean, this country was founded on slavery, so let's just know that yeah. there. A part of it is because Democrats want to absolve themselves of any guilt and responsibility, and they want to pin it, pin everything on Trump because it actually legitimizes the Republican Party, right? You, you see this. They hate Trump, but then now they love Bush and. Uh, Dick Cheney and Kissinger, crazy, because in 2008, Bush was the devil. Now he's an angel for hating Trump. That's it. And now they're also Mike Pence fans because they want to impeach Trump. I was like, you're going to get Mike Pence. How is that any better? 
It'll be worse. And I, I, let me just say this real quick. I, I because I was Mike Pence will be worse because Mike Pence will have polite tweets. He'll be he'll act presidential. He won't act like this vulgar, gross dude that Trump is. And the left will go right the fuck back to sleep like they did. Mm -hmm. and like, well, we got to get, and then we'll, we'll hear this just any blue, just get somebody else in, you know. And Mike Pence will be passing all these awful laws and everyone will just be back to brunch and hey, yay, we did it, we won. And it's, yeah. it's, it's the mean tweets they post. Yeah. That's they, basically. I, I always say like, like when Trump or when Bo Obama bo dropped 26,171 rockets in 2016, at least his tweets were nice, you know, and right. he had both flags on his bombs, you know, so it was like right. really, really sweet and nice how he bombed the shit out of everybody. Like he was so yeah. angel with his Nobel Prize. Yeah. Um, every week there's a new issue Democrats are bringing up. I remember it was a gun control a few months ago and then, you know, separating families at the border. And I have a very dark sense of humor. So I, I tweeted, I was like, okay, um, Democrats are against separating children from their parents at the border. They would just rather separate them limb from limb with bombs. And yeah, it, it, That's kind I of honest. Feed. I love your Twitter feed. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I'm a little too honest. Um, to me, right now, the Democrats are worse than the Republicans because the Republicans are what they are. But yeah. the Democrats pretend to be better than the Republicans when they're really not. Um, when people are getting bombed, they can't tell the difference between a DNC bomb and a GOP bomb, right? So for some reason, when I mention that to them, they can't process it. They, no, they refuse. I think, I think you're right. I think you're getting into, there's a lot of like, you know, maybe it's some form of white guilt or whatever within the, 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 the neoliberals who are just like, well, we're better and they don't want to grasp, they don't want to admit that, you know, 50, what, three, 55% of white women voted for Trump. They don't want to admit that, you know, Hillary Clinton, their big feminist hero, you know, I mean, I, I, I I'm just like, so like during the whole Kavanaugh thing, I'm like, let me see if destroyed I got- Destroyed Libya. Yeah, destroyed- Honduras. Like what she's done as, as a secretary of state was unreal, not to mention, you know, and then the whole, you know, so the women that accused Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein are telling the truth, but the women that accused Bill Clinton are lying. Like, yeah. You guys yeah. Know and yeah. what did she say about Monica Lewinsky recently? She said that um, Bill Clinton didn't abuse his power or something like that. <laughs> oh gosh. It was just, it was outrageous. Um, one thing I did see, I had to cover a lot of protests while I was in DC, um, March for Our Lives and the Kavanaugh protests. March for Our Lives was really interesting. I was like, wait, hmm, Democrats don't, um, they don't galvanize and you know mobilize to oppose war, but um, unproven, allegations of sexual assault and gun control, which is an important issue, but how did that manage to get so many protesters, but there's not maybe like a hundred people to at least uh, demonstrate against war. And I found out that the Democratic Party was busing students to the protests. It was funded by Bloomberg. And I mean, it wasn't grassroots. Let's just say that. And the Kavanaugh protests, that really, those really irritated me because that was, um, I think, right before, I, or I think my last week working at RT. And I asked a bunch of protesters, why are you here? They're like, oh, you know, we stand against sexual assault. Great, noble cause. Um, what about Kavanaugh's previous support for torture, NSA spying, and then blank. It's like, I don't know what it was, but it's just like the mainstream media, they feed you a narrative and then you repeat that narrative and you can't think beyond that. And it's paralyzing. That's it's fantastic. genuinely is paralyzing. paralyzing. I follow, yeah, I follow the internal politics of several different countries. U.S. opposition politics is by far the worst. Um, it's utterly ridiculous, especially the post-Trump era. So. Well, let's let's get into that real quick. Um, what it's like, you know, having you know, 
your views and then working for RT is how, how was that? Because some people just see, they see RT and they go, oh, Russian operatives. Like they can't even, they just doesn't, it, they won't even. And I'm like, have you watched it? I'll say, just watch it. They go, it's funded by, by Russia. I go, yeah. And, and, and MSNBC is funded by Boeing and Raytheon and ExxonMobil and, and the military. So. Right. So. Yeah. Um, well, state media, in my opinion, is a bit more neutral, a bit more objective than corporate media. Um, because uh, corporate media is beholden to corporations. State media, we ha actually have to, you know, um, present both sides, right? And I find it much better. Like I would rather go to Voice of America than CNN, for example. Voice of America actually has much better uh, coverage than CNN. They're more neutral. Um, I think it was NPR or PBS. They had an article about Russiagate. They said, oh, um, this investigation has been going on for two and a half years. Still haven't found anything. And I was like, NPR said that? What? If NPR is admitting it, then you know uh, what the story is. But it was, it was very difficult to work for RT in the sense that I was ostracized socially in, in DC. Um, once they heard I was working for RT, they wouldn't talk to me anymore. Um, and then also, yeah, yeah, it's that bad. But then they wouldn't do the same to like BBC journalists or Al Jazeera journalists or, uh, yeah, it, it's just Russia, right? Even CGTN, which is Chinese media, didn't have that stigma that RT had. And it all started with the ODNI report in January 2017, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. It was a, a CIA, FBI, NSA report that um, concluded that Russia had interfered in the election. And it was like a 14 page report. Seven out of 14 pages were about RT and how RT somehow influenced the election by uh, hosting third party debates. And um, what was it? Uh, talking about Wall Street greed. Oh, alleged Wall Street greed. And many of these things. Abby Martin's show was listed. Abby Martin's show had ended two years prior to the election. So it was mostly just absolute rubbish and garbage. And we were laughing at it because it looked like a parody of an intelligence report, not an intelligence report. <laughs> and then they used that in 2017, that report, to force us to register as a foreign agent. Uh, yeah, and the DOJ threatened RT, uh, the rest, and you know, free, they said that they would freeze RT's bank accounts, so we were forced to do it. Then after that, um, our press credentials to Congress were revoked. Yeah. Our press credentials to Congress were revoked. And then, uh, yeah, because we registered for FARA, they promised us. I had gone to uh, Heather Nauer, um, the State Department, and I asked these questions. You're like, oh, it's just a registration. You don't have to worry about it. But then under that, uh, I mean, using the FARA registration, they took away our press credentials. I was like, are you kidding me? So I went back to the State Department and I asked her and she made up some bogus answer. She's like, oh, you know, this, you have to ask Congress this. And I was like, eh, I don't have press credentials to Congress, but okay. Um, so she just pretty much ignored, disregarded the question. Um, and then there was an amendment in the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act. Um, it was called the McCain Amendment, which uh, allowed cable contracts to cancel contracts, uh, sorry, allowed uh, cable networks to cancel contracts with any network associated with the Russian Federation. Using that, a bunch of cable networks just started to, you know, cancel contracts with RT. Most recently, this happened with Comcast, I think maybe a month ago. So, you know, they're not going, they didn't shut us down and don't think they're going to shut RT down anytime soon, but they're making it very difficult for RT to operate, oh. which is a shame. And, you know, Ru the Russian propagandists on RT include Lee Camp, included Ed Schultz, now uh, Scotty Nell Hughes and Rick Sanchez. 
So it's just, it's mostly bogus. And it's funny that it's left, um, well, you know, like they're all freedom of speech and human rights violations when they happen somewhere else by somebody else. But then when they hear that, they just immediately go, yeah, we got Russia, we got Trump, Russia, WikiLeaks, you know, Julian Assange or just whatever. And it's just like, yeah, they, they anyone that, 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 as you said at the top of this, the, the tribalism, like they will, it's, it's, I noticed this, it's like, the American sports fan. Like I've been a sports fan for a while. Yeah, exactly. Like, Politics is a team sport now. It is. So my player, my, my team, you know, uses steroids or cheats or whatever. Oh, it's, you know, everybody does it. The other team does it and we need to fry that. It's just, it's just, it's, it's, it's crazy. So, um, but actually I got to get going because Ron and I got to do more shows for the progressive yeah. uh, comedy tour, but I, I really, um, I really appreciate you taking the time. We are going to be uh, on the East Coast in June doing shows in D.C. Great, and great. So maybe we can do an in-person interview. And of course, if you ever get yeah, to- that would that would be awesome. Thank you so much again for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, looking forward to next time for sure. Yeah, absolutely, thank you so much. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Please go like, subscribe, go to the Patreon, and all that stuff to keep the show up and running. And uh, Go to grandmelwood.com for tickets to um, Progressive Comedy Tour shows. We will be in D.C. in June. We're adding more dates uh, all the time. So go to grandmelwood.com. Thanks for watching.